the Word of God says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are here with us. We praise you and we worship you. You are our loving and good Father. Thank you for loving us so much to the point of giving us your Son, our Lord Jesus, to die on that cross instead of us. All authority is yours, Father, and there is no authority on earth unless given by you. And so today we ask that you give all our government leaders, our health workers, all our medical practitioners, our security forces, your wisdom, discernment, strength, and resolve. Keep them safe, healthy, and rested so that they can continue to guide us through this troubling time. Give all your readers from the Interagency Task Force, the Department of Health, the Philippine National Police, the DILG, and the local government units, your wisdom about what needs to be done to stop the virus and stabilize our economy. Give our medical scientists insight into how to stop the virus, strengthen their resolve, and honor their hard work in creating a treatment for COVID-19. Give our civic leaders inspiration, courage, joy, and strength to meet the needs of their communities. Give our spiritual leaders your discernment on how to meet people's needs as they continue to glorify your name and encourage the church. Thank you, Father, that we can get to be a part of your universal church. All believers of the Lord Jesus Christ at this moment, thank you for the opportunity to spread your love and hope to a world living in darkness and despair. Allow this season to strengthen your church and to remind us of how much you love this hurting world. Please heal our land and use us to meet the need of others. Grow our faith as you grow your church. Father, today we are proclaiming that you will be glorified through this pandemic, that your name will be known and praised throughout the earth. Pierce the darkness with your light. Shine brighter than the fear of death or economic ruin or a long quarantine. We look back on this moment in history and when we do that, we would be filled with joy as we remember the revival, the hope, and the peace that came out of this season. Father, continue to draw this hurting world back to you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. A blessed good morning to our brothers and sisters and our friends of Community Bible Church of Marikina and our daughter church in the Disciples of Jesus Christ of Barangay Tumana. In our previous studies of the book of Job, we watched this blameless believer suffer heart-rending loss. His possessions ruined, his children killed, his health destroyed. And we listened to the conversations in heaven as Job could not. He was totally unaware of this. 
the conversation between God and Satan and how the Lord gives this permission to Satan to torture Job. And again, may I remind you that, that, that Job is not being punished for his sin, completely the reverse. Job suffers precisely because he is a very godly man. And he suffers intensely. He suffered a deep, overwhelming loss, physical, emotional, social, mental, and spiritual loss. And yet, he still shows faith. With his trials, we hear two very remarkable and now often quoted statements of Job's responses to his ordeal. We read in chapter 1, verse 21, And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And the other one is the response that Job gave to his wife when, he, when she challenged him. And he said in chapter 2, verse 10, Shall we receive good from God, and shall we not receive evil? And I am sure we all aspire to respond in the same way when we experience our own trials and sufferings, right? No doubt all Christians wanted to attain the level of Job's faith in these two verses. This is, of course, highly remarkable. Job's faith is totally wonderful. But there is a danger with focusing on chapter 1, verse 21, and in chapter 2, verse 10, because if we focus only on these two verses, we will be looking at the fate of Job in a simplistic manner, just like a fairy tale story. Job suffered. He trusted. That's it. So should we, right? End of story. But friends... Brothers and sisters, it is far from the end of the story. Because we see today in chapter 3, even at the start of verse 1, that Job curses the day of his birth. And we shall see that Job goes on protesting about his ordeal chapter by chapter from here on. Job 3 is a very important chapter in our contemporary Christianity. There is a version of Christianity today that is very shallow and superficial, and some people call this kind of Christianity easy triumphalism or easy believism. It is a kind of Christianity that manifests in songs like, In the presence of Jesus, all your troubles go away. If you believe in God, all your problems disappear. And one author say it is a kind of Christianity that would have Jesus singing these choruses at the grave of Lazarus instead of weeping at his death. Brothers and sisters, we don't see Job singing this song in chapter 3. And yet, Job was a true and blameless believer. We must remember that Job's, Job is a God's servant. At the end of this book, God affirms that Job has spoken rightly of him. Chapter 42, verse 7. He is a righteous man who can therefore pray and expect his prayer to be heard. Brothers and sisters, listen to this. A true Christian believer may be taken by God through times of deep and dark despair. He or she may be taken through this darkness even though he or she has not fallen into sin or backslidden from his faith in Jesus Christ. This is a very important truth. And this truth is affirmed in the book of Job. The despair of Job is the authentic experience of a man affirmed by God at the start. Chapter 1 verse 8. Chapter 2, verse 3. And affirm again at the end. Chapter 42, verse 7. We need to remember that. And I know it is quite 
difficult to comprehend because even with the strong faith that Job has, chapter 3 is a very dark chapter. We see how Satan attacked Job skin for skin, layer by layer, the adversary, the devil, removed everything of Job's person. First, his possessions, his wealth, his household. Then Satan went in to ravage the inner layer, so to speak, his family, killing all his children. And then he has gone deeper still to strike the literal body of Job. And here we can see that he, it has fun, it has gone far deep at the very heart of this man. So for the first time in the book, but not the last time, we will now hear the cry of Job's heart and his soul. Because so far in the story, we have mostly been watching at Job, listening to the heavenly conversations, looking from above at the earthly disasters happening to this man. We have watched his loneliness as his comforter sat with him in a terrible seven days and seven nights of silence. Chapter 2 ended with the words, his suffering was very great. And we are now about to learn just how great his suffering was as we listen to his inner experience. Let us look at three expressions of his inner grief. First, we hear a curse in chapter 3, verses 1 to 10. In his darkness, Job can only look back. His mind is full of regrets and is empty of hope in the future. Let us read these verses together. Chapter 3, verse 1 to 10. After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. And Job said, Let the day perish on which I was born, and the night that said a man is conceived. Let that day be darkness. May God above not seek it, nor light shine upon it. Let gloom and deep darkness claim it, let clouds dwell upon it, let the blackness of the day terrify it. That night, let dark or thick darkness seize it. Let it not rejoice among the days of the year. Let it not come into the number of the months. Behold, let that night be barren. Let no joyful cry enter it. Let those curse it who curse the day who are ready to rouse up Leviathan. Let the stars of its dawn be dark. Let it hope for light, but have none, nor see the eyelids of the morning, because it did not shut the doors of my mother's womb, nor hide trouble from my eyes. Job's first outburst, outburst was a curse of the day when he was born. He cursed the day of his birth. He did not curse God, okay, as Satan would have told God that he would or that his wife told him to do. But he comes close to the brink of doing this. He literally cursed the day of his birth. In verse 3 it says, Let the day perish on which I was born. And not only that, he literally cursed the night when he was conceived nine months earlier by his parents. It says, the night that said a man is conceived, the end of verse 3. This is a totally comprehensive wish that not only he had not been born, but that he had not even begun as a fertilized cell in his mother's womb. How terrible. It was. Notice how Job gathers up all the words of darkness in verses 4 to 9 and pours all of them on the day that he was born and on the night that he was conceived. Job says in verse 4, listen to this, Let that day be darkness. 
that God would not allow light to shine upon it. Verse 5 says, Let gloom and deep darkness claim it, and that the clouds above would settle down, stay there, and dwell there, so that the blackness terrified that day. He's speaking about the night when he was conceived. Job wished in verse 6 that thick darkness capture it, seize it, and its darkness continue that it may not become part, it may not be included in the numbers of the months, meaning the nine months of pregnancy would not happen. It will not come to pass. Then he said it more directly in verse 7. Listen to this. Let no life spring out of that evening let it be barren no conception happens there in other words job is saying in essence that in the deepest intimacy of his parents during that night that darkness will not result to his conception look at verse 8 now Job is wishing that someone somewhere would have the power to curse that day when he was born. That that power would wake up the sea monster Leviathan, which we will meet again later in the story, and that dreaded monster will destroy that day. Then in verse 9, he would wish that the stars at dawn will not give its light, and that the dawn will still be dark, and the morning light will not come. All because, he said, that night did not close his mother's womb so that he would not have been born. In verse 10. Friends, we normally associate darkness with sadness, right? Darkness, danger, and gloom. When time began, we read in Genesis chapter 1 that darkness was everywhere and God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Yet we are seeing here was that Job was wishing that the night of his conception would be supernaturally dark and would be a night that never ended in day, that it would never see the eyelids of the morning. Such a terrible wish, isn't it? But it is a wish that is fanciful. Job cannot literally curse the past. The past is past, and he cannot change it. So let's reflect upon this for a moment in a normal life in a regular, normal, daily life. Almost nothing can rival conception and birth as signs of hope. I remember last year when one of our members, Joanna, tells us that she is expecting a baby. And all of us in the office rejoice. There is excitement and everybody is looking forward to that day when the baby will be born. And in fact, he was born during this community quarantine. We are literally filled with hope and expectation to see him in person after this crisis is over. And so why is Job making these terrible wishes? It is because for Job, every hope is gone and he sees nothing for the future. He has nothing to look forward to except a blank wall of hopelessness. For Job, there is no future for him, so he would rather that there had been no past. The last line of verse 10 explains further why he wanted his past to be erased in the world, because it would hide trouble from my eyes. You see, Job's conception and then Job's birth have opened the way for Job's troubles, right? He was saying if those days had been closed, trouble would have been hidden from his eyes. Job would not have known the pain, the grief, the bereavement, the misery, and all those evils that seemed to him so dark 
that they render life meaningless and worthless. Do you understand this? And so, the first outburst of his grief and torment, he looked to his past and cursed the day of his birth and the night of his conception. And so, his pointless curse, ineffective curse, flows into a desperate anguish in chapter 3, verses 11 to 19. Job cannot rest. He is unbearably troubled. And this terrible feeling of despair begins with the question, why? And ends with a place of the dead. So let us read verses 11 to 19. Why did, that, why did I not die at birth, come out from the womb, and expire? Why did the knees receive me, or why the breasts that I should nurse? For then I would have lain down and been quiet, I would have slept, and then I would have been oppressed with kings and counselors of the earth who rebuild ruins for themselves, or with the princes who had gold, who filled their houses with silver? Or why was I not as a hidden, stillborn child, as infants who never see the light? There the wicked cease from troubling, and there the weary are at rest. There the prisoners are at ease together, they hear not the voice of the taskmaster, the small and the great are there, and the slave is free from his master. Job begins with a question in verse 11, why? He says in effect, if I had not been, if I had to be conceived and born, why did I have to be born and stay alive? Why, I, why did I not count as one of those babies dying at birth? Notice the progression of movement in, in the sentiment of Job in verses 11 and 12, he was moving from the womb to the knees and then to the breasts. Bible scholar says, this is a ancient expression of sustainable life on earth. The mother fondly carrying the baby on her knees and then lovingly pulling him up on, his, on her breast. A beautiful picture of a baby being nursed and fed. But for Job, it was a disaster because it would launch him into a life that would end with unbearable misery. And so Job longs for the dead. Verse 13 mentioned four words that describe being dead. Listen, he longs to be laid down and be quiet, being asleep and at rest. In verses 14 and 15, he mentioned his companions there in the place of the dead, in Sheol. And quite surprisingly, there are kings and counselors, princes who had gold and silver. As if to say that the place of the dead is where everybody is equal. No one has a privileged status there. Your wealth, your riches meant nothing in Sheol. In verses 17 to 20, he explained that in the place of the dead, the wicked people cannot bring trouble anymore with their influence and their wealth. And the poor and weary will finally be at rest and not be oppressed anymore. They are no longer beholden to their bosses, to their taskmasters. All of them are of equal rank. The small and the great are there. The slave is free from his master in verse 19. As to how Job hammers down on the kings and the princes being in Sheol, it, it, it could very well be he still remembers the Sabaeans and the Chaldeans, the chieftains who ravaged his property and his household. He could have thought that in Sheol, at last, they will no longer be able to cause him any trouble. He was saying, in effect, if I had been stillborn, 
I would have been in Sheol, the place of the dead, and that would be peace. Although in, in his clearer moments, Job knows that this is not true, that Sheol is a terrible place. If we move ahead in chapter 17, in verse 14, Job knew it was where decay and worm are our father and mother. But in his desperation, even in Sheol, it would be a place of rest for him. And a deep reason for Job's desperate unrest is that he cannot understand his sufferings. He cannot understand why a believer, a man of godliness and devotion, suffers with so much mind-blowing intensity. This inexplicable trouble shakes the foundation of his moral and ordered universe. It is for this reason that he cannot and will not rest until he found some resolution to this cosmic question. Because deep in his heart, Job knows that human rest is rooted in the rest of God when he looks at the orderly and completed creation. Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. He knows rest is predicated on cosmic order, a creation in which there are proper boundaries, in which virtue is rewarded and wickedness is punished, in which there is justice, in which goodness triumphs. And Job longs to share that rest with God. But at that moment, his experience is the total opposite. And so he ends his speech, his monologue, with a tormenting question in verses 20 to 26. Job's lament extends beyond his individual experience to the common experience of undeserved sufferings of all the godly people throughout the world. So let us read these last verses in chapter 3, verses 20 to 26. Why is light given to him who is in misery, and life to the bitter in soul, who long for dead, death, but it comes not, and dig for it more than for hidden treasures, who rejoice exceedingly and are glad when they find the grave. Why is light given to a man whose way is hidden, whom God has hedged in? For my sighing comes instead of my bread, and my groanings are poured out like water. For the things that I fear comes upon me, and what I dread befalls me. I am not at ease, nor am I quiet. I have no rest, but trouble comes. It would seem that Job at this point is not merely referring to himself. As in verse 20, it says, Who is in misery and to the bitter in soul could be a rendering of others as well who were given this misery and bitterness. It is similar to expression of parents who have lost a child. There are men and women who have lost all hope and who cannot see the point of continuing to live. Job is asking, why does God give them life in the first place? Verses 21 and 22 speak with biting irony. These miserable people of whom Job is one, long for death with the same passionate longing of a treasure hunter, rushing out to the deepest jungle to, to find those golden treasure. Job and people like him dream of death in the same passion as the treasure hunters dream of gold. And when they die, their exuberance can only be understood when you think of the treasure hunting, hunter discovering this golden treasure hidden in the deep dirt somewhere in the jungle. Job is so obsessed with death as the only way of trouble because life is so futile. 
in verse 23, he describes and others like him as walking on a pathway that is hidden from God's blessing and grace. A God-forsaken walk and a path that is hedged in by God. To be hidden means to have no purpose, no meaning. You remember that Satan accused God of putting a hedge on Job's life by blessing him with prosperity and wealth? This time, the hedge that Job is talking about here is the reverse kind. It's like a huge barricade to keep Job imprisoned to a miserable life he wanted to keep away, but he could not. He is hedged in, trapped, and he cannot escape. And he wonders why God is doing this. His predicament at the time would have echoed the moving personal reflection of C.S. Lewis when, after the death of his wife, he wrote this article, A Gift, A Grief Observed. And he asked the question, Where is God? Let me read that for you. This is one of the most disquieting symptoms. When you are happy, so happy, that you have no sense of needing him. If you remember yourself and turn to him with gratitude and praise, you will be, or so it feels, welcomed with open arms. But go to him when you need, when your need is desperate, when all other help is vain, and what do you find? A door is slammed in your face and a sound of bolting and double bolting on the inside. After that, silence. You may as well turn away. The longer you wait, the more emphatic the silence will become. There are no lights in the windows. It might be an empty house, or was it ever inhabited? It seemed so once. Verses 24 and 26 emphasize on what comes upon Job. His sighings, groanings, things that he fear, things he dread, comes before him. He has no rest and trouble comes. It seems like he is the target. Things happen to him. What is given by God come to him. These things are the reality of his experience. But he does not, and he cannot know why. And this is the source of his deep unrest. He knows that God is the author, and he knows that these things have come to him. But why? Notice the climax of his monologue in verse 26 with four images of unrest. I am not at ease, nor am I quiet. I have no rest, but trouble comes. This is a torment not just of the body, terrible thought it might be, but of the soul. Again, look at the word trouble at the end of the sentence. A complete contrast with the idyllic picture of Job's situation in the beginning of chapter 1 a restful prosperity untroubled by pain. The question why will echo throughout the book. We are drawn by the tragedy of Job into a bigger, more, more alarming question than that of his individual tragedy. We saw how Job not only wants to undo his own life, but to question the creation of the world. Genesis chapter 1 moves from darkness to light, from night to day, from nothingness to life. Job wants to put it all into reverse. So, where is the gospel in Job chapter 3? We all know as Christians that the best is still yet to come. There are better things ahead, always. Even in our situation today with COVID-19, we know there is always hope. 
Why? Because our future is God's future. And our destiny is glory. Yes? Glorification with Christ alone and God alone. Romans 8, 28 to 30. But we need to recognize that, that there may be times in our lives, even as believers, when that future glory appears to be blank. And all we can do is look back with regret and tell ourselves, if only, if only this, or if only that. There is where Job is in chapter 3. It was a very miserable, hopeless time for Job. And so we ask, where is the, where is the gospel in chapter 3? Let me suggest to you three ways we can find the gospel in Job 3. Number one, even in darkness, Job cannot avoid God. It is unlikely that Job recognized the presence of God. He can feel it. He can think about it. And yet Job knows that he cannot turn away from that door as you uh, hear uh, C.S. Lewis uh, describing it in his article. Right there in the depth of his misery, he knows he has to deal with God. We shall see as the book unfolds that there is a great theme. His journey is in this. Even in the God's felt absence, he is somewhere there. We see it in the word given in verse 20. Job knows God is the one giving. Light and life have been given by God, and therefore it is with God we must deal. Even in his absence, God is present as the focus of Job's loss. There is a glimmer of hope in his suffering. But it will take some time before that glimmer will shine true. Number two, Job restlessness, as paradoxical as it may sound, it is a sign of hope. We have seen that the dominant tone of chapter three is restlessness. Job cannot rest with things as they are, and therefore he will not rest. In his misery and distress, there is yet an energy within Job that drives him to discover who has treated him like this. And although he says he has no hope, his restlessness betrays him. A restless man is not a defeated man. A troubled man is not a hopeless man resigned to his fate. If there is really no hope, there is no point asking why. And yet Job asked why repeatedly and forcefully. He says he wants to die, but his restless word betray him, for they are unavoidably pointing to life and the hope of rising again. Number three, Job's darkness anticipate a deeper darkness. At the end of Job 3, we leave Job terribly alone, sitting with friends who want to comfort him but have nothing to say. We leave him able only to look back with bitter regret that he has ever been born and wish that that day to fall into dark abyss so that it is erased in history. So is there anything that can be said to him? Even at this stage, there is something to be said. Beyond the silence of misery, beyond ev even the silence of sympathy. When we studied Job's 2, 11 to 13 last Sunday, we saw how loneliness, how his loneliness of suffering foreshadowed a greater loneliness. Today, 
we learn his deeper darkness likewise anticipates a deeper darkness. 2,000 years ago, another blameless believer was in deep darkness, hanging on the cross at midday, deeper than the darkness of night, deeper even than Job's darkness. And from his lips came the cry of dereliction, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We find that in Mark chapter 15, verses 33 and 34. And so, brothers and sisters, in some strange way, because Job's darkness foreshadows the darkness of the cross, there is within it the hope of vindication. Shall we pray? Eternal God, our Heavenly Father, in this crisis that we are going through, we thank you for giving us a model of such godly men as Job, who even with his incredible faith, you showed us his humanity and his real anguish as he expressed his grief in this chapter. And yet you affirm his devotion to you in the end. And because of this realization, we now have even more so the confidence that you indeed are gracious, you understand, and you remain our loving God, even in the midst of our crisis. And all this um, epidemic or in uh, pandemic that we are go going through. Help us to understand and embrace the reality of our situation as we unite with the rest of the people in this war against COVID-19 virus. We submit to you our, we, we submit ourselves to you, Father, because you are perfect and we know that you are, and you know what you are doing. We rest our hope and our salvation to you, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray all this. Amen. Ipinapaalala ko po sa inyong lahat na sa darating na linggo ay si Pastor Mike Crucio po ang magbibigay sa atin ng salita ng Diyos sa pagpapatuloy ng ating pag-aaral sa aklat ni Job. Sa darating pong Sunday ay ikaunang Sunday din po, unang linggo ng buwan. At kagaya ng ating nakaugalian, magkakaroon po tayo ng Family Communion Celebration. Ang aking pong kahilingan ay magsama-sama po tayo sa celebration na ito. Ihanda po ninyo ang elements ninyo sa bahay, ang bread and the grape juice. At pagkatapos po ng sermon ni Pastor Mike, I will lead you to a communion celebration as we remember the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ and His soon coming again. Okay po ba? Salamat po. God bless us all.